In the records of exploration, few places on Earth hold as much mystery and intrigue as the frozen continent. And amidst its icy expanse lies a tale that defies comprehension, a physicist's sudden disappearance. Just moments before he vanished, the physicist released a confession that sent shockwaves through the scientific community and left the world struggling with unanswered questions. What compelled him to reveal his innermost secrets and what dark truths lay buried beneath the icy surface of Antarctica? Join us as we unravel the terrifying confessions of a physicist just moments before he suddenly disappeared in Antarctica. The mysterious depths of Antarctica. In the icy expanse of Antarctica, a place as cold as it is immense, nature stands as an imposing force, reminding humanity of its ultimate dominance. This landmass, devoid of permanent inhabitants, remained untouched by humans until just a little over a century ago. Its extreme conditions, being the coldest, windiest, and oddly driest continent, make it a challenge for any who dare to venture there. Despite being almost entirely covered in snow, Antarctica sees little rainfall or snowfall, earning it the classification of a desert. The snow, accumulated over centuries, never melts in the perpetual chill. The harsh environment has claimed many lives and left even more souls devastated. Visitors to this unwelcoming land often find themselves torn between its isolation and its overwhelming presence. Some are drawn to its solitary beauty, while others find themselves driven to madness by its unrelenting silence. Life in Antarctica oscillates between endless quietude and the tumultuous cacophony of colliding icebergs and howling blizzards. Apart from a few striking mountain ranges and glaciers, the landscape appears barren and featureless. No trees or permanent wildlife inhabit this frozen realm, leaving vast stretches of pristine white snow as far as the eye can see. Antarctica has earned a reputation as a land of stark contradictions. Some see it as a tranquil haven of beauty, while others view it as a harsh and isolating nightmare that can drive people to madness. Over the past century, numerous chilling stories have surfaced from this icy continent. These tales range from mysterious disappearances and disturbing murders to accounts of people losing their sanity in the desolate landscape. Some even speak of pets being driven to a frenzy and killed by their owners. Among the most strange legends are whispers of hidden pyramids beneath the ice and the potential existence of ancient cities buried deep within the frozen ground. Antarctica holds on to its secrets tightly, refusing to yield answers to the curious. One particularly haunting story has persisted for over half a century, captivating the imaginations of those intrigued by the enigmatic mysteries of this remote realm. Carl Disch, a 26-year-old well-known physicist celebrated for his significant advancements in the field of particle physics, originated from a charming German town where his love for science, particularly physics, blossomed early on. His academic journey began with studying physics at a university in Germany, then led him across the Atlantic to the United States, where he earned a Doctor of Philosophy degree in particle physics. Carl's influence went beyond his research work. He was also a remarkable educator and mentor. Known for his excellent teaching skills, he was admired as a professor who was easy to approach and had deep knowledge. He was dedicated to helping young physicists grow, showing his commitment to shaping the future of the field, which earned him great respect from his students. The scientific world was shocked by Carl's sudden vanishing at Bird Station in Antarctica. The baffling Bird Station. The Bird Station, originally established by the United States, was a research outpost situated in a remote and frigid region of Antarctica. It comprised four prefabricated buildings and was erected by the United States Navy. Commissioned on January 1, 1957, the station, called the Old Bird Station, served its purpose before succumbing to the weight of the accumulating snow. The original construction of the Bird Station is particularly intriguing. Located at 80 degrees south latitude and 119 degrees west longitude, it was far from being a tourist destination. Navy personnel assigned to establish the station during the 1956 to 1957 season were part of the International Geophysical Year Initiative. 
This global effort aimed to foster collaboration among scientists from different countries, including those from both the Western and Eastern blocs of the Cold War era. The International Geophysical Year sought to promote scientific cooperation for the good of humanity, bridging ideological divides for the sake of advancing knowledge. Initially, the Navy personnel were hesitant about embarking on a daunting journey, covering a thousand kilometers by tractor train across the dangerous, crevice-ridden ice of West Antarctica. However, they surprised themselves by completing the terrifying journey twice in a single summer. Their remarkable feat led to the establishment of one of the first research stations deep within the Antarctic interior. This original station was named after the renowned polar explorer Richard E. Byrd, Jr. The construction of the new station was a hurried and improvised effort during its first season, officially commissioned by the military. The fact that it was built within a mere month is astonishing, considering the extreme conditions and remote location. A tunnel system connected the five main buildings of the original bird station, but unfortunately, most of the supplies for the underground corridors never arrived. Faced with this challenge, the resourceful personnel improvised by welding together empty oil drums to serve as vertical columns for the tunnel framework. During the first winter, the crew of scientists and Navy personnel endured hardships, including limited food variety and a scarcity of libations. Their ration included a mere 10 cans of beer per person for the entire dark season. Such limited provisions undoubtedly posed a challenge, especially considering the long, dark Antarctic nights. The original station was in use for only four years due to the risk of collapse under the weight of snow. To address this issue, construction began on a second research station in 1960. This new station, where Carl went missing, was located about six miles away from the original site. The construction process involved lowering prefabricated buildings with steel arches, known as wonder arches, into man-made trenches. These structures were then manually covered with snow. Interestingly, this construction method was pioneered and tested by the United States Army in Greenland. The new bird station was officially commissioned on February 13, 1961. The majority of the new station was located underground, with tunnels connecting various scientific facilities. These tunnels supported the largest inland scientific program of that time. While information about the station's layout is scarce, it likely consisted of a main complex for living quarters and separate scientific areas surrounding it. One such scientific location was the Radio House, where Carl Disch conducted his ionospheric studies. It's important to note that the radio station was distinct from his living quarters, which were likely located elsewhere. The distance between these buildings and how they were connected will be crucial in solving the mystery surrounding Carl's disappearance. Over the years, the station underwent several upgrades and rebuilds. However, in late 2004, it was finally abandoned. Carl Robert's Disappearance One year before the disappearance of Carl Robert Dish, he started working at Boulder Laboratories. As part of his job, he was asked to join a research team in Antarctica. Even though it seemed daunting, Carl agreed to it. He was then assigned to Bird Station. For the next six months, Carl spent most of his time working in the Central Propagation Laboratory. His job required him to work long hours at the Radio Noise Building, a small hut positioned a mile northwest of the main complex. Despite the distance, the two facilities were connected by a hand line, a rope to guide researchers during bad weather. Carl had made this journey many times before, so he knew the terrain well. Just a few days before Carl disappeared, reports say he started acting strangely. His behavior became erratic and unpredictable, worrying his colleagues at Bird Station. They tried to reach out to him for help, but he didn't respond. This change from a reliable professional to someone troubled caused concern among those who worked with him. They wanted to support him, but he didn't want to engage with them. As days passed, Carl's behavior became even stranger. He wandered around the station aimlessly, mumbling incomprehensibly and doing odd things. His co-workers were worried about him, but he didn't listen to their attempts to talk to him. On the dark morning of May 8, 1965, Carl left the radio noise building for the last time and got lost in the unforgiving landmass. He set out at 9.15 in the morning, during nautical twilight heading for the main complex. 
Despite wearing Antarctic clothing for protection from the minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit temperature and strong winds, he didn't reach his destination by 10 in the morning. This raised concerns, prompting his colleagues to assemble a search party and send them along his planned route. At 11.30 a.m., a set of footprints was found near the radio noise building. The footprints started at the ladder by the hut, but instead of going south like expected, they went west toward the ski way. What could have led him to do this? Perhaps something caught his attention. A strange noise or a light? Maybe something hovering over or landing on the runway? Did Carl's curiosity prompt him to investigate, causing him to disregard common sense? One of the searchers noticed that there was no change in stride in Carl's tracks, as if he was purposefully walking towards something rather than stumbling around aimlessly. If he had indeed gotten lost, why didn't he just follow his tracks back? These questions only deepen the mystery surrounding Carl's disappearance. Carl's colleagues followed the trail for about four miles to the southwest edge of the station's outer boundary before it suddenly stopped. Sometimes the tracks looked deliberate with consistent long steps rather than uncertain ones, suggesting Carl wasn't lost or confused. After that, the team went back to the base to refuel. Once they refueled, they went back to the skiway corner and searched the area for three hours, but they found nothing. When they tried to return, strong 30-knot winds made it hard to get back safely. Finally, they made it back to the base at 6.15 p.m. Then, they started a big search of the supply line, the emergency Jamesway, and the fuel dump, but it didn't lead to much. About an hour later, Carl's colleagues formed a human chain to search the path from the base to the skiway where his footprints disappeared. Even though the weather was tough, they used floodlights and launched flares every 30 minutes. But when visibility got too poor, these measures didn't work anymore. The next day, a third search party set out with vehicles to explore the path from the base to the skiway. Despite finding occasional untouched tracks heading southwest, they suddenly vanished four miles from the radio noise building. Two days after Carl disappeared on May 8, 1965, another extensive search operation kicked off. This time, eight men, along with two vehicles, a Jamesway shelter, and essential supplies were deployed. They started their search from the main complex and moved southward, conducting thorough sweeps to the east and west. To track their progress, they used flags. Despite venturing 12 miles beyond the station's limits, they found no trace of Carl. On May 12th, search teams expanded their efforts to the northeastern and southwestern areas of Bird Station. Although the weather seemed favorable, the darkness of the Antarctic night posed challenges to visibility. As days passed, the search faced additional hurdles with strong winds and fog, making it nearly impossible to continue. Despite covering an extensive area totaling 35 square miles by May 14th, Carl remained elusive, adding to the mystery of his disappearance. Further search efforts were planned for the return of daylight in the spring. This aspect of the mystery captivated many observers. This suggested that a recovery effort was being considered, presuming his body was out there and needed retrieval. Surprisingly, there was limited information about these upcoming searches in the spring. It was difficult to believe they didn't occur, but it seemed they weren't successful, as there was no mention of them in reports. Considering the extreme conditions, it was understandable that the search would be challenging. His friends and family in Monroe held a memorial, as did his colleagues at Bird Station. This marked the start of a mystery that has lasted over 50 years without closure. The questions from then still linger today. Why did Carl change his route and vanish without a trace? Theories surrounding Carl's disappearance. Numerous peculiar tales and theories have circulated regarding Carl's mysterious disappearance. One of the most talked about theories surrounding Carl's vanishing centers on the weather conditions mentioned earlier. It's believed that when he left the radio noise building, strong winds, poor visibility, and the vast white landscape may have disoriented him, causing him to wander off in the wrong direction. Once he strayed a bit, finding his way back would have been tough. However, Carl had made that same trip more than 20 times before, and given his experience, it's unlikely he'd miss the hand line and wander so far from his path. The rope was right in front of the ladder he used to descend from the building, 
so he couldn't have missed it, even in low visibility. Also, the fact that he walked in a straight line for about four miles and his tracks showed no signs of uncertainty challenges this idea. Additionally, if the search party could see his footprints, Carl could have retraced his steps back to the radio noise building. Another possible reason for Carl's sudden absence revolves around the idea of a mental breakdown. Some suggest that he may have had a breakdown because he felt cheated during a card game just before he disappeared. It's said that he slammed his cards on the table and announced he was going to visit his friends at the South Pole. The unchanging landscape might have worn on his mind, pushing him to leave the building and take a walk to clear his head. But someone as experienced as Carl would have known that such an action could be dangerous in such a harsh environment. Understandably, small issues could seem bigger in those conditions, but it's still puzzling why a successful person like Carl would react that way. Not surprisingly, some people have suggested supernatural explanations for Carl's disappearance. Investigators point out that his footprints abruptly stopped in the middle of nowhere. While skeptics think that the footprints might have been covered by snow, believers in the paranormal believe that Carl simply vanished. While the idea that the footprints were covered by snow is possible, some members of the search party claim to have seen strange lights and heard odd noises around the time of Carl's disappearance. Another theory that is often overlooked is the potential involvement of the Soviet Union. There's a story about a British Royal Navy commander who vanished during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 while in Antarctica, similar to Carl's disappearance. It later emerged that the commander had been secretly working for the Soviet Union and was taken by them just before his cover was blown. Carl's disappearance coincided with the Cold War, and as an expert in his field, he would have been valuable to the Soviets. This could also explain the strange lights and noises reported in the area. However, this theory is weakened when we consider the vast distance between Bird Station and the nearest coastline. Unless the people who rescued him or took him away had a hidden base nearby, this explanation is also faulted. Some have posited the theory of polar bear attacks as a potential explanation for the predator attacks in Antarctica. However, this notion is promptly dismissed upon closer inspection. This dismissal stems from the undeniable fact that these creatures are not native to Antarctica. With this key detail in mind, the focus of scrutiny shifts away from the realm of four-legged predators altogether, leading investigators to explore other avenues for answers to Carl's puzzling disappearance. Another theory suggests that Dish was working with an extremely dull partner. His monotone voice could have driven anyone crazy after spending a long time with him. Imagine how tough it would be to endure long shifts with someone so boring, especially in a job like theirs. It suggested that, just like the card game example, Dish had simply had enough. He left to clear his mind, but it's puzzling why he would take such a risky step, knowing the dangers of the harsh environment. Maybe things had really gotten unbearable, or perhaps he left without intending to return. But why would he consider something as extreme as suicide? While it's understandable that small issues might feel bigger in such isolated conditions, it's hard to fathom why someone like Dish would react this way. He had a promising future ahead of him. In this situation, though, not finding a body is a problem. Normally, you'd expect to find something. Despite the variety of theories, none of them seem solid enough to reach a definite conclusion. What makes this case fascinating is the difference between the little information we have about the disappearance and the wide range of possible explanations offered now it's time for today's subscriber pick. In the frigid expanse of Antarctica, Dr. Thomas Wells, a renowned physicist, stood amidst the towering icebergs, his breath crystallizing in the icy air. With trembling hands, he reached for his recording device, his heart pounding with anticipation. I cannot carry this burden any longer, he whispered, his voice barely audible above the howling winds. The world must know the truth. As the recording began, Dr. Wells revealed a shocking confession, detailing the unethical experiments he had conducted in the pursuit of scientific advancement. But before he could finish, a deafening crack echoed across the frozen landscape. In an instant, the ground beneath him gave way, swallowing him whole 
as the ice cavern collapsed around him. And just like that, Dr. Thomas Wells vanished into the icy depths of Antarctica, leaving behind only his haunting confession echoing through the frozen corridors. As the search team combed through the wreckage, they found no trace of the physicist, who had released a confession just moments before he suddenly disappeared. The chilling remnants of his final words are etched into the ice, proof of the mysteries that lurk beneath the surface of the southern continent. An expert's insight. In his book, Our Haunted Planet, the late John Keel delved into the mysterious aspects of Carl Robert Dish's disappearance. He mentioned a peculiar quote from the Baltimore Sun regarding the search dogs used in the rescue mission. Ron Sepp, a writer at the Sun and the leader at Bird Station, expressed that if Carl had fallen and was lying in the snow, the Huskies would have found him long before the searchers did. Similarly, if he had fallen and been covered by drifting snow, the dogs would have detected the mound and investigated it, as Huskies are known to do. This observation is similar to cases documented by David Paulides, where search and rescue dogs struggled to track missing individuals. Shortly after Carl's disappearance, his own husky, Gus, also vanished. If Carl was on foot, how could he have traveled such a distance without being found by either humans or animals? Adding to the intrigue were reports from searchers of encountering strange phenomena during the five-day search. They described seeing mysterious lights in the sky and hearing strange noises resembling a loud generator or engine in the distance. Despite their efforts, the searchers were unable to pinpoint the source of these lights and sounds. Antarctica is mostly uninhabited, aside from international scientists who collaborate closely. Yet, these inexplicable occurrences left the searchers thoroughly unsettled, raising more questions than answers about Carl's disappearance. It's highly unlikely that the strange sounds and lights encountered by the scientists were just from other people hanging around, especially considering that much of the search period was marked by a blizzard, making it even less likely. So if not people, then who or what could be responsible for these eerie phenomena? Carl's mysterious disappearance raised significant concerns about his well-being and shed light on the challenges of conducting search and rescue missions in remote and harsh environments like Antarctica. The collaborative efforts of experts showcased a meticulous approach to unraveling the mystery surrounding Carl's vanishing. Interviews with Carl's associates were conducted, and video and audio recordings from the station were scrutinized. The inquiry delved into Carl's personal history and relationships, seeking any clues that could shed light on his sudden absence. The meticulous examination extended to exploring Carl's past and personal connections, hoping to uncover leads regarding his mysterious disappearance. Dish's vanishing has deeply saddened his loved ones, leaving them shattered. Whispers from the ice. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Casting long shadows over the snow-covered buildings of Bird Station, a lingering sense of unease settled in. The tale of Carl Dish, the scientist who vanished into the icy wilderness, remained vivid, etched into the very ice that likely enveloped him. His memory refused to fade, echoing through the chilly breeze like a haunting melody. Some people claim to have seen and heard from Carl and his dog a few times since their disappearance. What's strange is that both sightings occurred at McMurdo Station, even though Carl vanished from Bird Station, about 1,400 kilometers away. Despite this distance, there have been two separate reports of an untidy-looking man appearing at one of the station's busiest bars, the Erebus Club. Originally named Gallagher's, and later renamed in honor of a respected quartermaster who passed away at the station, the club wasn't just a bar. It also had pool tables, a dance floor, and even served hamburgers. It was the go-to spot for drinks on weekends and had a regular morning crowd of workers looking for a pick-me-up after their night shifts. Twice, workers at the club have encountered a mysterious figure. One night, as a club employee was closing up and putting money in the safe, he spotted the figure. Here's what he described. I glanced over my shoulder and saw an old man standing at the bar's end. He wore worn out gray cold weather clothes with a white beard and hair. I focused on the safe, spun the dial, and then turned around, but the man was gone. 
I walked into the main room, but he had vanished. There's no way he could have left that quickly. I'm certain I saw someone at the bar. Billy Ace insisted it was Carl Dish. Whoever it was, seeing them made me completely sober. Another worker recounted seeing the same mysterious figure, this time accompanied by a dog. They both disappeared suddenly when he looked away. But perhaps the most intriguing story comes from the person referred to as Billy Ace. Billy Ace served 11 times in the icy region during his Navy days as a radio operator. He spent winters there between 1963 and 1975, and summers from 1974 to 1980. After leaving the Navy, he stayed involved with clubs for former Arctic workers and explorers, contributing to publications in the same field. However, it was during the winter of 1971 when he supposedly intercepted a strange message. According to a story he wrote, Billy received a message one night while working at McMurdo. It was from Carl, who had disappeared six years earlier. The message originated from a station that was only staffed during the summer months, making it unusual for anyone to be there at that time of year. This is what the message said. I am Carl Dish. To the world, I am considered dead. They believe my body lies frozen somewhere on this vast white continent. But I tell you, I, Carl Dish, am alive. Don't think for a moment it was an accident. Everything was planned. They pushed me, tormented me, bored me with their shallow lives. I left them behind, renouncing the human race. Six years ago, on a desolate Saturday night, I walked out of Longwire Station and never looked back. They searched for me, as I anticipated, following my deliberate footsteps for miles. But they never found me, never realized they'd been deceived. They gave up, and I, Carl Dish, became truly free. I'm the loneliest man in the world. Surviving for six years hasn't been easy. Sometimes the endless howling of the winds almost drives me crazy, making me yearn for human company. But that longing quickly fades away. I've been tormented, rejected, and betrayed by my fellow humans, even those I cared for. It may seem foolish to endure such hardship and loneliness when others like Bird and Shackleton barely escaped, but my story surpasses theirs. I consider myself a genius. Even in my earliest memories, I knew I was different. Others sensed it too and feared me for it. So, I walked away from their fears, paranoia, and jealousy. Born to ordinary parents, I lived a normal life until my first birthday. 25 years later, I find peace in my shack, which slowly shifts with the continent. After my parents died in a Nebraska tornado when I was just a year old, I ended up in an orphanage with nothing to my name. There, I observed the others closely, knowing I was superior to them. Perhaps even then, they plotted against me, and maybe even then, Carl Dish dreamed of escaping. The pink bird painted on my crib's headboard, which tasted of enamel when I licked it like any curious child, became a sign of my future and salvation. Years later, as I took my last glance at humanity before leaving, all I could see was Bird Station. As expected, this has sparked much debate. It's been refuted simply because it's thought to be impossible for someone to endure six years on the ice. Additionally, it appears that Billy has blended real facts with fiction in his storytelling. While he mentions real individuals who were present at the time, he also includes others who weren't. Because of this, many people have outright rejected the story. What do you think happened to Carl Dish? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below.